Okay, let's talk about inductor. I'm curious. Yeah, there's there's a few key things to keep in mind here. Um, one of them is the core material of the inductor, what it's what's physically made out of. Um, so it's going to be a copper wire that they wind to get your inductance, but then what is that core wrapped around it? Mm -hmm. um, and for you know the buck regulators we're talking about today, there's two main choices. There's you know usually a, a ferrite core or a composite core, or powdered core they call it sometimes. Um, and those have different characteristics. So for example, the ferrite core has a lower DCR for a given set of parameters than the composite core, uh, but it also has a hard saturation curve. So if you look at these inductor data sheets, the inductance stays kind of flat with load. And then at some point it starts to roll off mm -hmm. um, as the load current gets too high. And if you have a ferrite core, it has hard saturation. So you're going along and then it falls mm -hmm. off a cliff. Uh, a composite or powdered core kind of rolls off very gently. So depending on your application, if you're in a very strict current range, you know you'll never hit that saturation point. Maybe you want to go with a little bit um, lower DCR and up your efficiency at mm -hmm. the risk of if something were to go wrong, you fall off that cliff, your inductor looks like a dead short, you pull too much current, maybe you blow up the inductor, the output capacitor, your FETs, the load. Um, hard to say. It's a, a gamble you're taking on what could be damaged if you saturated your inductor. Um, Whereas if you have a very dynamic environment, different currents, different voltages, everything's changing all the time. Um, a composite inductor with a softer saturation curve might be what you want. That way, if you accidentally go too high, you don't just, you know, short off and uh, shut down your regulator or damage your system. What about shielded uh, and non-shielded inductor? Um, yeah, so the shielded versus non-shielded will definitely um, affect your EMI. Obviously, a shielded inductor will contain the fields, uh, the flux lines a little bit better. Um, and then that's where replacement comes in, too. Even if you buy a shielded inductor, if you put it on your board wrong, you could hurt your EMI. What does it mean um, wrong? Yes. Uh, so if your inductor is marked, um, you know, look at like this little example I drew here. There's that little dot on some of these inductors that you can buy. Uh, that dot should go to the switch node as you place it um, on the board and you solder it down. Switch so node is where the, transit, where, where the MOSFETs are. Yeah, well, your MOSFETs are switching. Yeah, your switch node. Um, so as you uh, as they build the inductor, you know, you have to start somewhere. So they have their coil wire, and then they wind around, and then there's a coil you know, on the outside of the inductor. Um, well, the coil inside of the inductor, if you connect it to the switch node, that means the uh, other node of the inductor goes to V out, which is a quiet DC node. And since that's on the outside of the inductor, it shields the noisy switch node from radiating outwards. But if you put the inductor on reversed, all of a sudden your switch nodes on the output side, and they can radiate out even with a shielded inductor. Nice, that's so nice. Something tip. to keep Very in track good of. Tip. Yes. Okay. Um, so even like non-shielded inductor still can work well if you place the inductor correctly. Yes. Yeah. If you if you design um, as you're laying out your board, and I apologize, I don't have a, a layout we can look at live here. Um, as you place the board, and you can find all sorts of app notes and papers on how to lay out uh, switching regulators. The loop, uh, your FET loop, your switch node, and then this loop here between your inductors, your output capacitor, and then back to the FET um, are your critical loops. They're high current, high voltage switching. Uh, so if you do them poorly, they can excuse me, radiate and sing like you wouldn't believe. Um, so keeping these nice and tight and small and compact is your best way to minimize um, EMI. Okay, I think you have it somewhere in the next slide. So let's move to, yes. to inductor, um, physical size yep. and value. Uh, yeah, that's the last thing I want to hype on that real quick. Um, don't forget the Z-axis when you <laughs> size your inductor. Um, so you have your XY footprint and then inductors also come in different thicknesses. So for a you know, five millimeter by five millimeter inductor, do you need one millimeter height, two millimeter height? Can you go with 10 millimeters? Um, and that's you know where to, where to break from the data sheet as well. Uh, if you're picking inductors or um, if you're picking a regulator that's spec for a laptop, well, these days laptops are all paper thin. You can't stick a mm -hmm. conductor in there. Um, but if you're just doing an open top board, like you know, a Raspberry Pi or an Arduino board or something that's open to the air, well, you have a lot more play in what kind of inductor you can use. Um, so if you get a taller inductor, typically you get better efficiency because you have more core mm -hmm. uh, in the inductor and you have lower core loss. Um, so it's a, something where if you just follow the data sheet and say, oh, they recommend um, you know, inductor one, two, three, four mm -hmm. from whatever yeah, vendor, 
I'll throw that in there, even though it's, you know, for your application, it's totally wrong. If you have that extra height you can do, you can squeeze out an extra little bit of efficiency from your regulator that you might, other, might oh, not again, otherwise again, get. Again, very nice tip. I like it. Yes. <laughs> yeah, don't limit yourself if you don't have to. Um, and then, you know, This is the other interesting topic. People always yes, keep talking about capacity. I could talk about this all day. Yes, absolutely. So low, um, low ESR or zero ESR or 